loving and almighty God, uh, gosh, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the rain that you gave us this last week. We may just be asking you for a little bit more of it here in a minute. Uh, we appreciate so much the, the ways that you've blessed us. I, I thank you for the blessing of this gathering of these folks who are seeking to learn more about you. Uh, and we do thank you and praise you for the fact that you've enabled us to, to know you, that you've created us out of your love, to live in that love, to be a part of that love, and to, to seek through that love to get to maybe just a little bit closer to you. We thank you for the opportunity you've given us this evening to do just that by digging into the uh, gospel of your servant John. Uh, please bless this time together. Bless our eyes, our ears, our hearts, our minds. Enable us through this time to draw closer to you. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right. So we are going to start out in, verse, in chapter 11 of John's Gospel. So we... Um, so we're, we're kind of approaching the end of Jesus's public ministry. Talked a little bit about that uh, last time we were talking about uh, chapter 10. We're getting closer and closer to it as Jesus gets closer and closer, although I guess he keeps kind of goes back and forth. Um, but he's, he's at least in chapter 11, he's going to be pretty close to Jerusalem. Um, and so this Chapter 11 is all about the raising of Lazarus. First, Lazarus' death, and then Jesus raising him, and kind of the aftermath of that, what, what happens as a result of that. Um, so the background, starting out, well, actually, how about I read just uh, verses 1 through 16 real quick. Now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany the village of Mary and his sister Martha, and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard about that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After th saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. So that's the first part of, of chapter 11. Now the background for chapter 11, um, part of the background of that is we, Lazarus. This is a story about Lazarus. Um, and we're used to hearing this story. But it's interesting that this chapter and chapter 12 are the only two chapters in, in the New Testament where this particular Lazarus shows up. You may remember, I think it's from Luke's gospel, there's a different Lazarus. He's, he's a poor man who hangs outside the house of a rich man. That's a different one. This, so this is the only place really where Lazarus appears in the gospels. Obviously, Jesus cares a lot for him. Now, the Bethany that we're talking about here is different than the Bethany that we were talking about uh, back in chapter 1. I remember a question came up. It's like, well, how's he getting back and forth? But uh, That Bethany is maybe, it's, it's also called Batania, and it was like about 100 miles northeast 
of Jerusalem up in, in the region of Galilee. And so this Bethany is about two miles away from Jerusalem. It's just right outside of Jerusalem. Um, so Jesus has, has um, you know, he's, he's up in this other, this other Bethany uh, close to Galilee, pretty far away from Jerusalem. Um, and he's called to go down to the Bethany that's just right next to Jerusalem. Um, now, uh, Mary is referred to towards the beginning of this passage, uh, and it's, she's referred to as the one who anointed Jesus, which, you know, we talked very early on about how, about why John's gospel is so different from the other three. The other three are very similar, um, and John's gospel is different. And I think one of the conclusions we reached is, well, the reason that John wrote his gospel was to kind of fill in some of the holes with the other ones and to maybe fill out some of the theological understanding of who Jesus is that isn't so well fleshed out in those other uh, three Gospels. And so this is kind of an indication of that. He's talking about this Mary who anointed that someone reading this, he's assuming that whoever's reading this will already be familiar with those other three Gospels. And so they'll know that that's the Mary that he's that he's talking about. It presumes their familiarity with the other three Gospels. Um, so he starts out and he gets this message in verse 3. It says, He whom you loved is ill. And this is one of those situations where it's, it's helpful to kind of understand the cultural context, right? So back in, in that culture, and still in a lot of Eastern and Middle Eastern cultures, um, Drama isn't so much a thing. Um, th this, you know, this that looks to us pretty innocuous. You know, he knew he that you loved is ill was kind of like in in our day saying, you know, oh, my God, your best friend Lazarus is about to die. You need to get up here right away. I mean, that's sort of the equivalent of what this understated message from, uh, from his friends is the fact that they sent him the message at all uh, shows that they are terribly concerned because they wouldn't have bothered him otherwise. They're terribly concerned about him. And so it's not just that Jesus ignores the fact that, that this friend of his is ill. You know, someone t says to me, you know, such and such is ill. I'm like, okay, well, I'll pray for him. If they say, well, they're on death's doorstep, then, then my response is going to be different. And Basically, this message to Jesus is, Lazarus is on death's doorstep. You need to get down here quick. Um, so Jesus then goes, then says, you know, he says, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it's for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Um, and so here, it seems pretty clear in light of what happens later that Jesus is talking about some other kind of death than just physical death. Um, he's, he's talking about sort of like the permanent death that happens uh, if you don't come to believe in him. So he's talking about spiritual death. And then he says that it's for God's glory. And we've talked before how this is an ongoing theme within John's gospel. You go back to, um, to the last chapter, you know, it, there's that... Um, the whole point of this book, the whole point of John writing this, was that you could come to know God and, and believe, right? It's, it's all about God's glory. Um, now, the other thing, you know, he says it's for God's glory, and you could come to the conclusion based on that, you know, that God made him sick and that God made him die, that this is sort of God... Um, you know, making bad stuff happen so that he can be glorified through it. Uh, and it's the same, the same uh, question we have with, with the blind man, right? Who made this man blind, his parents or, or him, through his sin? Um, and I think the conclusion here is the same as the conclusion that we reached there, which is God didn't make that guy blind. Bad stuff happens. God can take whatever bad thing happens and turn it towards good 
Romans 8, 28. Um, you know, God will work good for all those who believe, right? So um, that's what's going on here is that he didn't make Lazarus sick so that he could make him well later on. He's going to use the opportunity of Lazarus' sickness and death to bring glory to God and thereby to bring glory to Jesus so that people can come to believe that he is actually God's son. So, so as a result of that, Jesus stays, to make sure that God's glorified through this, Jesus stays a couple, a couple more days. Now, he wouldn't have been able to make it back in time anyway. Um, he wasn't going to be able to keep Lazarus from dying. Uh, what he does is he waits a couple of days, as we'll see, to make sure that um, Lazarus is like really dead before he brings him back to life. So he stays a couple more days where he's at, way up north. Now he's, like I say here, he's, he's probably in Bat, Batania, which is near Galilee, 100 miles northeast of Jerusalem. Um, Lazarus was probably alive when, when Jesus received the news, but a couple of days later, uh, two days less than it would have taken Jesus to get back, um, Lazarus is probably dead. So that's the point at which Jesus announces to his disciples that he's fallen asleep, which they misunderstand, and, and he has to clarify it for them. No, he's, he's really dead. And so it would have taken him about four days to, to get back um, so that he would have been, Lazarus would have been dead for about four days. So at that point, Jesus says, let's go back to Judea. Uh, in verse 7. And that was a big risk because like the disciples point out, um, they're trying to kill you, right? I mean, the last, last we saw of Jesus and the religious authorities is they're picking up rocks to throw at him, to stone him to death. And, and now he's saying, well, let's, and they've just apparently not too long ago gotten up way north, far away from the people who are trying to throw the rocks at him. And now he's saying, well, let's go back. Um, and it's been recent enough to where the people who are wanting to throw the rocks at him will not have forgotten that they want to throw the rocks at him. So uh, the disciples are rightfully concerned, right? So they point out, yeah, look, there's people who want to kill you. Um, and so then Jesus starts talking about walking in the daylight and walking uh, in the nighttime, right? So he answered them, starting in verse 9, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of the world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. So, I mean, we've seen this motif of light and dark already, right? I mean, it started in verse, in chapter 1, where he calls himself the light of the world, but the people chose the darkness instead of the light, and we've been seeing it. We saw it in chapter 9 with the man born blind. We see it over and over where he's contrasting the light to the darkness. Well, here he, he brings in the concept of time. He says, aren't there 12 hours of daylight? And one of the reasons I think he did that is because, you know, remember he's been, he's been talking, or at least John has been talking and Jesus has, has talked a few times about his time, his hour. My hour is not yet here. My time has not yet come. By introducing the concept of time here and talking about 12 hours of daylight and then comes the darkness, Jesus is starting to suggest that his time is nearly up, that his hour has nearly come. Again, we're getting towards the end of his earthly ministry. Um, and, and he's saying to his disciples, you know, as long as I'm with you, me being the light of the world, as long as I, Jesus, the light of the world, am with you, you don't have to worry about stumbling. You're going to be okay. The, the, the religious authorities, the, one who's want, the ones who want to kill me, they're going to focus on me. They're not going to worry too much about you. Now, we'll see later on when in his farewell discourse that he's going to warn them, well, when I'm gone, that's going to change. And that's kind of what he's suggesting here. When, when he's gone, there's going to be some stumbling going on. But at least for now, they're going to be okay. And so he's kind of reassuring them a little bit. Um, yeah, it's, it, it looks like it could be ugly, 
but y'all don't have to worry. We're st- you're still walking in the light. We can go back to Judea. You're going to be okay. I might not be so good, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be okay for y'all, at least as long as I'm still with you. Um, so then in verses 11 through 15, he starts talking about the, the you know, Lazarus has fallen asleep but I'm going there to awaken him. They don't quite understand what he's talking about. And then he says to him plainly, Lazarus is dead. So um, one of the things he tells them in that, in that passage is that this is going to be an opportunity for them to deepen their faith. Um, and this, again, is a recurring theme in, in this gospel, is that all of these signs that Jesus is doing, you know, uh, healing the man by the pool, healing the man who was born blind, um, ultimately in this chapter, raising Lazarus. These are all signs pointing to who, pointing to God and pointing to Jesus as God's special uh, son. And the more of these signs that they see, hopefully, the more they'll begin to understand who he is, the greater or the deeper their faith, their faith will become. And, and so he keeps saying that, and, and he's saying this to them now. He said it to the Jews, to the, you know, to the religious people already, he's saying it now directly to his disciples. This is happening so that your faith, this is going to work to the benefit of your faith, the sign that I'm fixing, fixing to do. At which point Thomas says to him in verse 16, okay, let's go die with him. You know, what, what does he actually say? Let us also go that we may die with him. Now, who do you think the him is that he's talking about? I had always thought that it was Jesus. But there's another guy whose life is on the line here too, right? Lazarus. So who do you think it is, Jesus or Lazarus? Jesus, got two Jesuses. Got any Lazaruses? Got a Lazarus? Got a, got a few more Lazaruses? Well, okay, here's, here's, and I'm not sure that anyone's come up with a definitive answer. The commentaries kind of differ on this. The question is, what is Thomas doing here? What's the actual question that Thomas is asking? I think that answers the question, right? Because if Thomas here is being sincere, if he's, if he's showing his commitment to Jesus, then I think he's saying, let's go there with Jesus and die with Jesus, right? Saying, I am committed to you, I'm, I'm committed all the way, and if they get you, they're going to get me too. On the other hand, he might, be in, he might be being a little bit of a smart aleck. And, and it just kind of depends on what you understand of Thomas's character here. So he, he could be saying, are you serious? Really? You really want to go to Judea? Well, then, heck, why don't we just go and die with him, right? Uh, in which case, he may well be talking about Lazarus. Lazarus is already dead. If we go there, we're as good as dead. So let's just go do it. Or maybe not suggesting they go do it. He's just sort of saying, this is crazy. I can't believe we're actually even thinking about this. So it just kind of depends on what you, what you believe about Thomas. And we'll see him a few more times as we go through this gospel. And then maybe by the last time we could get some, maybe come to some conclusions about what he's, what he's doing here. I, the, the guy whose commentary I'm sort of mainly reading on this, I, he, he's convinced that Thomas is being a little bit of a smart aleck. And that he's just sort of saying, you're crazy. We shouldn't do this. So, um, Jesus, they, so they, they finally, they, you know, the scene shifts, right? So, so they're up in Batania, and then starting in, Jesus, in verse 17, they're now down in Bethany. So they've, they've traveled the four days down to Bethany. Um, when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. So Lazarus, in this passage, he's been dead now, according to verse 17, for four days. Have any of y'all ever seen The Princess Bride? Anybody here ever seen The Princess Bride, the movie? Okay. Um, for those of you who've seen it, do you remember, um, what, what was it, Magic Max? Remember Magic Max? So they, so they bring the, the, the hero to this magician, and, and, and he's dead. And they're, they're asking the magician to bring him back to life. And so the magician says, you know, what's, you know he says, well, he's dead. And, and Ma- Magic Max goes, he's not dead, he's mostly dead. He's mostly dead. There's a big difference between dead and mostly dead. And so the four days here is to indicate that Lazarus is not mostly dead. He is plumb dead. He's, he's dead, dead. Um, and, 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 you know, sometimes they would keep the, the bodies uh, accessible for like three days because they believed that for three days the spirit... Would, would maybe hang around the body and could possibly reanimate it, but after three days, uh, all bets were off, which is uh, why the four days here is significant. Now, verse 19 suggests that there were a lot of Jews there. It says many Jews were there, um, and I never really paid much attention to that, but um, there's a couple of reasons why that may be. One is that they were within a couple of miles of Jerusalem, Another one is that Mary and Martha and Lazarus were probably pretty well off, and they probably knew a lot of people. They were probably pretty well connected. In the next chapter, in chapter 12, we're going to talk about you know, Mary's anointing of, of Jesus' feet with this incredibly expensive perfume, which they probably wouldn't have had just sitting around if they were, if they were destitute. So... Um, we got we got and the other reason that it's important that there's many Jews there is because of what's going to happen next, right? After Lazarus is resurrected, then the the news is just going to go everywhere because there are many Jews there with them. And so, um, in verses twenty through twenty two, we see this expression, this initial expression of Martha's faith. So, you know, when Jesus shows up, when she sees him, she shows. You know, she shows her disappointment. You know, if, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Uh, and she shows that she doesn't understand what he's doing or, or, or um, you know, what, what's going to happen. But she also demonstrates absolute faith in him, right? I mean, she, she says, what does she say? Uh, but even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Um. John, in this story, one of the things that he's doing is contrasting the faith of this, of this woman. And remember the, the sort of low esteem in which women in that culture were held. She's contrasting that, or he's contrasting that, to the lack of faith, the inability to see who Jesus was among the religious authorities, as we'll see at the end of this chapter. Uh, so we've got this this really pretty astonishing statement of faith on Martha's um, part. And then Jesus says to her, well, he's going to rise again. And she says, duh. If you read 23 and 24, that's basically her saying, duh. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he's going to rise again with the resurrection on the last day. That's, that was just sort of an article of faith among the Pharisees and also among most of the Jews of that day, that it, at the last day, everyone would be raised up again. Um, and so for her, that wasn't like a big thing. Yeah, it's going to happen. Um, but 
But then he said, then he then he goes on and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. So this is another one of those I am sayings. I am the water, I am the light of the world, I am the resurrection and the life. Um, and in saying I am the resurrection and the life, he's again suggesting that this resurrection, the resurrection he's talking about isn't just a resurrection at the end of time. It's not even just a resurrection to new life after you die. It is a new life that is available right now, as we've already talked about before. Um, and he sets this up as, as he sets up the sign that he's fixing to do with, with Lazarus. The, the resurrection that he's about to do with Lazarus. I am the resurrection, and I'm fixing to prove it to you. Um, and so, let's see, then in verse 26. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. He says, those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Um. And so what he's talking about there is that this life um, is the gateway into new life. Physical death is the gateway into new life for those who believe in him. Um, so he's, he's drawing a real clear distinction between physical death and uh, spiritual life. He's drawing that connection very, very clearly um, and saying that you know the resurrection that he's talking about He's fixing to sort of like show it uh, through resuscitating Lazarus, but he's making it really clear to her that what he's talking about is more than just bringing some guy back to life who's eventually going to die again anyway. He's talking about new life and eternal life. Um, and so then Martha makes her other confession, her, her, her second confession of faith. Uh, she says, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah the Son of God, the one coming into the world. So, again, he's, he's like setting Martha up as, a, as a, an example of faith, as, um, a, you know, this is what faith looks like. Because if you go back to, um, if, if you go back to where? Um, Peter's confession. You know, P Peter confessed earlier, back in chapter 6, he said that Jesus, you know, who else are we going to go to? You know, Jesus says, you're going to abandon me? Well, who else are we going to go to? You have the words of eternal life. You're the Holy One of God. That was his confession. The, the Peter, the leader of the apostles, um, the one Jesus chose to build his church upon, and the confession of this woman in Bethany kind of puts Peter's confession to shame. He's, he's not just the Holy One of God. He's the Son of God, the unique Son of God. He's, he's also the one coming into the world, which is the one who, who Moses predicted would come after him like him. He's the Messiah that all the prophets prophesied. Um, he's the, all of those things wrapped up into one person, which no one else to this point in the gospel has 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 brought this these things together into this one person. He's been asked about all those things, but she's confessing it. This is my belief. Um, really, kind of kind of astonishing that she would that she would believe that and that she would she would say that. Um, so, um, Jesus then calls for Mary. So this is verses 28 through 32. So when she, Martha, had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. 
When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her were also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. All right. So Jesus sends for Mary and, and the exchange between Martha and Mary is kind of private. And I don't know if you noticed that. She told her kind of privately, maybe whispered it in her ear. Maybe Jesus was hoping that this wouldn't become like a big thing. Um, and so he may have actually asked for that. It's like, you know, maybe we can just sort of do this on the down low and it, and word won't get out or, or whatever. Uh, so, so Martha tells Mary what he's asked her uh, to do. Um, and and both and they refer to him as rabbi, as teacher. This would have been really unusual for it wouldn't have been at all unusual for the men who were following Jesus, but it would have been unusual for the women if he wasn't already also teaching them, which you just didn't do back then. Um, there weren't any female rabbis. The rabbis would only choose male followers. So for the the clear implication here is that Jesus, that these two women were also disciples of Jesus. Um, The fact that they called him teacher, that they called him rabbi, which is pretty would have been pretty radical in that in that day and age. Um, So, of course. If Jesus was trying to do this on the down low, it didn't work because all the Jews got up and followed Mary because they thought she was going to the tomb to um, to grieve. And so this ensured that there would be lots and lots and lots of witnesses to what Jesus was figuring, figuring uh, fixing to do. Uh, and then Mary, when she gets to Jesus, she says the same thing that Martha said. You know, if you'd have just been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Now, she doesn't go in into the rest of it. Maybe she said some of the same other stuff that, you know, the expressions of faith and stuff. But um, she expresses both her her disappointment that Jesus wasn't there and also uh, her faith that had Jesus been there, things would have turned out uh, differently. And then, so in verse 33, like I just read, Jesus was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. Um, so what does that mean? Um, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. So I'm, I'm reading out of the NRSV, New Revised Standard Version. Anybody else got a different translation of that part towards the end of verse 33? Deep anger, yeah. Deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Okay, yeah, that's that's the next one, I think. That's 35, Jesus began to weep. Yeah, so there's like a, there's lots of different ways to translate. There's a couple of words in there in Greek that, that you can translate lots of different ways. So some people, um, the literal cl- translation is kind of close to something like bristling within himself or snorting like a horse. Uh, and, and so the translators are having to figure out what to do with that. You know, it's like, well, what, what do you do with that? Um, so some, some just go like, like this and say he was deeply moved. Some, there is an element of anger and indignation in there, like the snorting horse idea is like this horse is really angry. Um, but, you know, what would he have been angry at is, is a good question. Uh, some say death, the fact that death is there and death has taken his friend. Uh, the fact that death is, is sort of a manifestation of Satan's rule in this in this world uh maybe the mourner's unbelief there's lots of different theories about what he was angry about if he was angry 
And then there's some translators who, who translate this into something more like excited expectation, anticipation. Because he's about to have a showdown with death, and he knows it, and he's going to win. And, and so it may be sort of like this, you know, like when a horse is fixing to go into battle or, you know, like how you get, you know, amped up before you're, you're going to go, you know, do something really big. Um, maybe it was that kind of ec- excited anticipation um, as he's fixing to go in and, and do this thing. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, there's no way he's going to be able to do this quietly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, now he's he's guaranteed that there's going to be a big audience and there's going to be a lot of people seeing what he's fixing to do. Uh, but before he actually does it, as you as as you pointed out, Joanne, he, he's um, or Jeanette, he he's he wept. Um, Jesus began to weep. Um, and so it's really interesting. I, I think one of the reasons that John puts that there, he didn't have to. I mean, Jesus could have been crying, but John didn't have to note it. I think one of the reasons he put it there is to remind us of Jesus' humanity because he's about to do something that no human would be able to do. And and so John wants to remind us. Well, not only is he, you know, the all powers, all powerful second person of the Holy Trinity, he's also a human being who's who's weeping. Um, and that raises the question, of course, what's he crying about? Um, some in the crowd they attribute attribute it to how much he loved Lazarus. Seems kind of unlikely because um, he knows what's about to happen to Lazarus, so he knows he hasn't lost Lazarus. Um, Others point out, well, he could have saved him, you know, which, of course, he's fixing to do. Um, and then other, other commentators think that he's just grieving over the presence. Again, sort of like why he's bristling and snorting. Um, he's, he's grieving the presence of death in this place, in his presence. Um, and... Um, and maybe grieving over those who are going to choose spiritual death instead of spiritual life by rejecting him. So then verses 38 through 44, he goes ahead and, and does it. Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face Wrapped in a cloth, Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. So again, Jesus is he's greatly disturbed. He's bristling within himself. He may be snorting. Who knows? Um, he may be angry, may be excited expectation, but he, but he goes to the tomb. And then he says, you know, roll the stone away. And of course, Martha... Remember, no one knows what's fixing to happen except for him, right? So let's say you got this guy who's been dead four days, and Jesus says, roll the stone away. Maybe you, maybe you start to get a sense of what he's talking about, but I mean, it's like, gee, why? I mean, you're, you're exposing this guy who's been dead for four days to... to you know, humiliation, you're exposing his family to humiliation. 
uh, Martha's response here is perfectly understandable, right? It's like he's been dead. Why would we want to do that? Um, and of course, the fact that he's been dead now for four days, again, highlights the, the hugeness of this particular miracle. He's not mostly dead. He's really dead. Um, and then he says, well, this is going to be for the glory of God. Right? Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So again, we've got the point of this, the point of what he's fixing to do is the glory of God. Uh, so they ended up taking the stone away. And um, then Jesus um, does his prayer. Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. Exactly the same thing that he said to his disciples when they were four days away. Um, so that you know, this is happening so that you will believe. The whole point of the gospel, this, this is all recorded here so that you will believe, so that God will be glorified and you will believe. And you will believe not just in God, but also that God sent me. And now he's not limiting it that just to his disciples. He's, lim- he's, he's covering everybody who's there, all of those people who showed up, uh, whether he wanted them there or not. And then in 43 and 44, when he had said this, he cried in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Um, so this miracle demonstrates Jesus' power over death, that he's, he has and he will conquer death. It's a preview of his resurrection. Um, so um, so in, in the, the, um, the term dead man in 44, verse 44, is the same term that is used in chapter 19, verse 33, to refer to Jesus. Could have said Lazarus, but said dead man. Reference to the strips of linen uh, uh, parallels Jesus' grave clothes, which were left behind in the tomb. The cry that he, uh, you know, the the great cry that he issues here um, is a preview of uh, foreshadowing of the cry that he's going to issue on the cross. Um, And the real irony here is that in performing this miracle and giving Lazarus back his life, Jesus is signing his own death warrant because all of those Jews came to watch what was going on. Um, they're going to go tell people, and that's going to get that's going to things are going to get rough after that. Um, and, and interestingly enough, the physical life that Jesus has given to Lazarus, that he's given him back, that's eventually going to die. I mean, that's that's eventually going to end. Lazarus is again going to die. But he has given Lazarus, or he will give Lazarus through his death and resurrection, um, through the death warrant that he signed for himself, he's going to provide eternal life to Lazarus and to anyone else who believes in him. And then when he says unbind him, um, that is, you know, that's sort of what Jesus has just done. He has unbound him from the arms of death. Um, at least temporarily. And through his coming death and resurrection, which this pre uh, foreshadows, he'll be doing it for, uh, for Lazarus for eternity. So here's a question that never, ever occurred to me until I, until I was working on this. How do you think Lazarus felt? I mean... It just it, it, it totally glosses over la- how Lazarus felt about this situation. What do you, I mean, do you all have any thoughts about like what Lazarus was going through as he like finds himself standing outside of this tomb with grave clothes on him? Would have been shocked. Absolutely. Any other thoughts?
Yeah, would he have we been? That. Yeah, we would he've. Yeah, we assume he would be excited, but would he have really been excited? You know? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, he he might, he might have come back kicking and screaming, right? <laughs> but if Jesus called you, I think you'd probably want to come back. Oh gosh. Yeah. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. They would have been in a tough spot without him there to take care of them. Any other thoughts on how Lazarus felt about this? Well, think about that. And if any of you have any real, like, deep um, insights, let me know. Because one of these days I'm going to have to preach on this. And, and I think I may end up putting that in there somehow. Um, and so I'd, I'd really like to get a sense of how he felt. I, I think shock, um, amazement. It's like, why the heck are all these people here? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, coming back and seeing your friend Jesus there, that would have been pretty awesome. Mm. Might have been a little humiliated. Well, yeah, he's probably stinky. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and he probably felt, yeah, he probably was, was entirely healed, and so he would have, I mean, there would have been some real excitement about that for sure. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I was dead. Wait a second. JL? That's. I hadn't thought of it that way. That he that he just he he sort of wouldn't have remembered anything, and and therefore was like, "What's going on?" <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Huh. Well. That's, I mean, it's just an interesting question. Obviously, there's not an answer to it, at least this side of that bridge that we haven't crossed yet. Um, so what happened as a result of this, of this miracle, this sign that Jesus gave in the presence of all of those witnesses of, of you know, sorry, his power and his, and his identity, right? Um, well, what happened was uh, the, the, a plot to kill him. So uh, many of the Jews, starting in verse 45, many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what he had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the council and said, What are we to do? This man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. You do not understand that it is better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. He did not say this on his own, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was about to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but to gather into one the dispersed children of God. So from that day on, they planned to put him to death. <clears throat> so as we've seen before, 
whenever Jesus performed one of his miracles, or as John calls them, signs, a number of people believed in him uh, based on these signs. And G John makes it pretty clear through the gospel that the people who believe in him just because of these signs, um, that is maybe kind of a not completely mature type of faith, uh, and that they, they probably will need eventually to go deeper in their faith. Uh, but at least we got this group of people now who, um, who, who, an additional group of people who now believe in him. Uh, and then we got another group of people who go to the Pharisees. And um, it's not clear to me, maybe y'all have some ideas on this, whether they're like, you know, tattling on him or whether they're just letting the Pharisees know that this incredible thing has happened. And I'm not sure it really makes any difference. It probably could have been a little bit of both. Um, they just want to make sure that, yeah, the religious authorities, they ought to know about something like this, kind of like what happened with the blind man. Um, so the Pharisees apparently go and they tell the chief priests, which itself is kind of interesting, suggesting the animosity they had towards Jesus We've already talked about how the Pharisees and the priests hated one another, yet for this purpose they were getting together. So they call together a meeting of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council. And interestingly enough, from this point on in the story, the priests take over. So the priests represented the, um, kind of like represented the government. The, the Pharisees, they were, they were studiers of the law. And, and they urged the people to follow the law. But the priests were the ones who had the real political power in the Jerusalem of that day. And so from this point forward, the, the priests are kind of driving the bus. The, the political establishment is kind of taken over to suggest that Jesus' time is even more limited. Um, so... They acknowledge, in, in verse 47, they acknowledge that Jesus is performing many signs. Uh, <clears throat> so before you remember in, in chapter 9, they were trying to decide whether he was really doing signs or not. At this point, they acknowledged, well, you know, we can't deny Lazarus is alive now. We can't deny that he's doing this stuff. This blind man he's, he's seeing now, he's doing these signs, uh, but they still reject him. They still refuse to accept him, um, which, con which confirms that there's really not any amount of proof that's going to be able to convince them that Jesus is who he, who he says it is. Um, it, nothing's going to get them past this fear that they've got uh, that Jesus represents some kind of threat. And so what is the threat that Jesus represents to them? And at least in part, and, the, and this is what they say here in the passage, at least in part, they're concerned that, um, you know, if it, if, it become, if it starts to look like the Jewish Messiah is at work, they're in Jerusalem, the heart of Judaism, and this Messiah, most of the people understood as a political um, military leader, the Romans would get understandably concerned about that and that they might even destroy the temple and remove what, what political autonomy the, the Jewish people had at that time. And they had more than a lot of people did. Um, and so the, 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 the concern that they express here, which was a legitimate one, is that it, if it looks like we've got a military leader coming up within, within here and we got everybody believing in this guy, the Romans are going to retaliate. They're going to destroy the temple and they're going to um, take away our freedom. That's, that's what they were saying. And there was a reason for them to believe this, right? Because the, that's what the Babylonians did. They destroyed the temple and they took the people off into captivity. Later on, just a few hundred years before this, the Seleucids, the, the Greeks... They, they desecrated the temple. We talked about that already. They, they conquered them. And so this was a real concern that they would have had. But I think they also were, were concerned sort of in, in conjunction with that, that you know, Jesus was a threat to their authority, not, not just a threat that, that the Romans personified. But if everybody's believing in Jesus, then they're not believing in the priests and the Pharisees. 
and they're not going to follow the priests and the Pharisees. And so they, say that they saw him as a threat to their own authority as well. Uh, and of course, this gospel was written back some, sometime after the temple was actually destroyed. Sometimes after, because what happened was the same kind of political expediency that led them to execute Jesus was, was what led the Romans ultimately to, to come in and, and destroy the temple in, in the year 70 and basically level Jerusalem. Um, so by, by killing Jesus, they in one sense brought to pass exactly what they were trying to avoid. Uh, and so they're like, what do we do about this? And Caiaphas gives them the answer. Now, let's see if anybody gets this quote. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. Anybody get that one? Okay, good. Thank you. Yes, that's from Star Trek. Um, and, and, and that's exactly the logic that Caiaphas uses here. We got to kill Jesus. It's better that he die and that the rest of us live. Of course, it's easier to say when you're talking about somebody else as opposed to yourself. Um, and the idea was that this would be politically expedient, right? We get rid of him. The Romans are happy. Everybody's happy. Uh, but as the, as the text points out, he's actually um, unintentionally prophesying that Jesus is going to do exactly what he's saying he's going to do, just in a very different way than he anticipated. Jesus is going to offer salvation to everybody. Not just the Jews, but as Caiaphas says, also to the dispersed children of God, who he probably intended as the diaspora, the, the Jews who were all over the world, but um, really represented everybody in the world. world. So from this point forward, Jesus um, is, I mean, and he's, he's a marked man. They're going to kill him. The, the wheels are now in motion uh, he knows they're going to kill him. So we read there at the very end. Now the Passover, or, or Jesus therefore no longer walked about openly among the Jews, but went from there to a town called Ephraim in the region near the wilderness, and he remained there with the disciples. And so he knows they're fixing to kill him, so he, he goes away about 20 miles north of Jerusalem to this place, Ephraim, uh, and he waits. he's going to wait there until it's finally his time. And then in verse Verse uh, 55 uh, and 56 and 57. Now the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and were asking one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think? Surely he will not come to the festival, will he? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who knew where Jesus was should let them know so that they might arrest him. So this is the third and final Passover. Uh, we've, we've, through the course of his earthly ministry, you know, kind of started there with the Passover. He's, there's been another one, and now he's at this third Passover, the third one of his, of his ministry. Uh, and everybody's wondering, as they did <coughs> back, um, I guess it was in chapter 6, Maybe it was chapter 5. When, when, you know, is, is he going to be here? Is he going to show up? Is he not going to show up? Um, because they must have known that the, that the religious leaders had a contract out on him. Um, and, and the leaders are looking for informants to let them know where they can get Jesus, where they can arrest him in a way that is going to be least disruptive. Especially, which is especially important during the Passover because you got the population, ordinary population of about 100,000 going to a population of about a million with people coming in for the Passover. They got to, if they're going to get him, they got to get him off by himself um, in, a, in a context where there's just not going to be a whole bunch of people around because it was kind of like a tinderbox and they didn't want to do anything, anything to set it off. So that's where we leave things going into chapter 12. Jesus' public ministry is pretty much done. Um, there's a little bit left. We'll get to that in chapter 12. Um, but his, 
his time of public preaching is just about done. And we're fixing to get into his time of, probably won't get into it next week, but the week after that we'll start talking about his, his last instructions to his disciples. So um, any, any prayers that we've got other than even more rain than last time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'd ask the same thing. My mom moved yesterday from the from that facility to live with my sister. So prayers for her and for my sister as they try to coexist in the same space uh, and for her to regain some of her mental acuity as well. So for Shirley and Barry, any any other prayers? All right, well, let's go to God in prayer. Uh, Loving God, we thank you so much for this time that you've given us together. We thank you for your presence here with us, uh, for the the fact that you're with us always, but in particular for your presence here with us in this time and in this space, uh, to, to bring us closer to you, to help us to learn more about you so that we can live our lives more uh, with you as a part of it. Uh, loving God, we ask this evening for even more rain. Uh, God, we... We desperately, desperately need it. You know that we do. Uh, and so we just, uh, we just throw ourselves at your mercy and ask for, for more of it. Uh, Lord, give us, give us that rain that we need. And Lord, we ask um, for Barry and for his family and caregivers as uh, he, in the coming days, adjusts and they adjust to a new normal. And Lord, we just ask for your healing touch in his mind. We ask the same for Shirley uh, and for my sister Patty and her family uh, as they seek to um, reach some sort of equilibrium in in the new uh, situation that they find themselves in. We ask again for your healing touch in Shirley's life that she can get stronger and that she can um, and that you can um, heal her mind. Lord, we ask all of this in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.